Hello, everyone. My name is Dinesh Naidu, and I'm your moderator today. On behalf of all of us at the Center for Livable Cities in Singapore, welcome to the inaugural webinar in our series, Cities Adapting to a Disrupted World. Let me start by calling on the executive director of our center, Mr. Ku Teng Chai, to say a few words. Mr. Ku, the mic is yours. Hello, let me thank all of you for attending this very first uh, CLC sem uh, webinar. So this webinar series is themed cities adapting to a disrupted world. And that is the theme of our World City Summit that we decided on even before the COVID <coughs> pandemic. So it's obviously now very appropriate, right? So the WCS, which would have been in July in Singapore, has been postponed to June 2021. And we hope this series can be our way to keep the CLC and the WCS community uh, together. And already I'm spotting some of the familiar names in the audience. But we are very encouraged that this webinar has attracted uh, an overwhelming response. Uh, more, almost, a, almost 1,600 people have registered from 64 countries. Whereas the typical CLC lecture that we hold physically in Singapore usually get about 200 attendees on a good day. So today's topic is about us envisaging how we can create healthy cities that can be more resilient in the face of not just pandemics like COVID, but other health challenges that plague all our cities. Now, cities like Singapore face even greater challenges because of our rapidly aging population. Now, a healthy city is a clean city with clean water and modern sanitation, but it also has accessible healthcare facilities, and most importantly, I think, an environment which promotes healthy living for all ages with parks, open spaces, walkways, and cycling paths. So increasingly, we need to bring two groups of people together, urban planners and healthcare professionals, to work together to make our cities healthier and more resilient. So today, we have done just that by bringing together a healthcare and an urban planning expert to share their thoughts with you. Enjoy the webinar. Thank you, Mr. Ku. Today's webinar features two presentations by our expert speakers, Dr. Lok Wai Chiong and Professor Lam Ki Po, followed by a panel discussion and audience Q&A. If you have any questions for our speakers, please click on the Q&A tab at any time during this webinar. This will open a chat box where you can type your questions. While in the waiting room, we hope you had time to take part in our live poll. We will also share the results during the Q&A. This session is being recorded and we will upload the recording on our social media channels, as well as a report on the webinar, so stay tuned for that. Now, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our first speaker today, Dr. Lok Wai Chiong. Dr. Lok is the Clinical Director of Programs and Head of Integrated Health Promotion at the Ministry of Health Office for Healthcare Transformation here in Singapore. At the Healthcare Transformation Office, Dr. Lok leads Integrated Health Promotion, or InHealth, which is studying how precincts and communities can be designed to encourage healthcare, health-promoting behaviours. He will be sharing more about this later. Prior to joining MOHT, Dr. Lok was a management consultant advising governments, investors, life sciences companies, and healthcare providers on a wide range of healthcare topics. He started his career as a practicing family physician and went on to hospital management and health policy leadership roles across the public and private sectors. I'm sure Dr. Lok has many insights to share with us on how the community and its surrounding environment has an impact on our healthy behaviors. Dr. Lok, the mic is yours. Hi, everyone. Um, I feel very privileged to be here today. Thank you very much, Dinesh, for a very kind introduction. And also, of course, uh, Mr. Ku for setting the stage for today. I, I would like to first say that um, it is a very interesting topic, right? Healthy cities 
uh, have been talked about for some time now. Um, and for many years, in fact, there are good ideas, there are pilots, and there are cities already embarking on this, even standards around buildings and urban design. And Prof Lam, who will speak after this, is a true expert in this area. But during this time, perhaps there is greater relevance because how do cities adapt to disruption? And, and unfortunately or fortunately, uh, disruption happens to be due to health issue currently. So let's start by giving you, I'd like to start by giving you a bit of introduction of what Ministry of Health Office for Healthcare Transformation does. Um, so we are MOHT, we try to look at the future trends. What are the, some of the things that are coming in the longer term and whether or not we could experiment with some game-changing system level concepts and innovations, uh, including promotion of good health, prevention of illness, delivery of care. We divide ourselves into three, basically three arms, uh, where we look at hospital care, uh, primary care, which is going to be very important, uh, and, and I look after integrated health promotion. Now, basically in Singapore, how we call this uh, the three beyonds. We need to move beyond hospitals into the community. We need to move beyond healthcare into health. So into prevention, into promotion. I think that is such an important thing that, that we need to not only uh, put a focus in it, but to integrate efforts, exactly as Mr. Ku say, even across health and non-health uh, players as well as agencies uh, across the country. Now, interestingly, we also know that um, the burden of disease across the world is changing, especially in uh, more affluent countries, more advanced economies. In Singapore, for instance, the Singapore Burden of Disease Study in 2017 says that heart disease is number one, mental health is number four. So these are big burdens of disease causing significant um, um, uh, impact to quality of life. Uh, but these are also modified, caused by modifiable risk factors. For example, and we all, all know it's about exercise, diet, about having a healthy behaviors as well as lifestyles and habits. Um, but these problems around chronic diseases uh, are compounded, made worse because of aging population. And Singapore is one of the fastest aging populations in the world today. But ultimately, we are looking at a scenario where healthcare costs will increase. Well, the good news is that prevention is possible. As I've said, if, if it's due to habits and lifestyles, then prevention is indeed possible. We know to reduce the chance of heart disease. Uh, experts, WHO recommends that we everybody has at least 150 minutes of moderate activity or 75 minutes of intense exercise per week. Right? But in daily life, what it means is be more active, you know, get out of the office chair, walk around a lot more, um, take breaks and uh, to, to walk rather than to sit in a car or in the office. But how can we actually incorporate health into our usually sedentary lifestyles, especially in the modern society? I think here is where we talk about enticing, nudging people to new behaviors, isn't it? Uh, and we do know that the environment plays a big part. Again, thanks to Mr. Ku for setting the stage. We do know that these environment factors, for instance, from studies, uh, in, are associated with uh, higher levels of physical activity, such as residential density, uh, traffic intersection density, so it's not long stretches of road, uh, but you can actually have intersections where you, you are actually uh, able to know how far you've walked, public transport density, as well as number of parks. So these are amenable to I suppose, smart and thoughtful urban planning as well as building. Next comes to diet. After exercise, we talk about diet, right? Dietary risk are number one risk factor in, in terms of Singapore's burden of disease because it affects everything from diabetes to heart disease. Uh, but it is also modifiable by reducing sugar, fatty and salty foods, uh, and eating sufficient greens, right? Vegetables. Healthy eating behavior, however, is influenced very much so by culture and the environment around us. This study, for example, in the US, shows that an increase, 10% increase in outdoor food advertisements, and who can mistake, you know, the double arches or something like that, have been shown to increase overweight prevalence by up to 5% in the US. And I think the cultural, um, and, and also what the social norms around a person does in fact uh, uh, affect quite a bit of your eating behavior. 
So in, in a sense, just looking at physical activity and healthy eating, and I'm not going to go further, there are other also healthy behaviours that we need to look at. What MOHT, the Office for Healthcare Transformation in Singapore, is proposing is to work through precincts, right? Where in the precinct, we can holistically address aspects of barriers as well as facilitators uh, to positive and um, healthy behaviours. So we are looking at social environmental factors. A person doesn't just behave because he believes it's good. Sometimes we know, we know enough that this is healthy, that's not healthy, but we don't do it because, well, our friends are not doing it. Our, 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 uh, the, the society, the community around us is not practicing the same thing. Um, the wider environment, we know what is healthy food, but we can't find it when we need it. Um, we want to exercise, but it's too hot to walk outside, especially in Singapore. So, so we think that if we adopt a precinct level approach, it's a purposeful strategy that can center on settings and place and where that unit of leadership, you know, clarity around organization, uh, resourcing, decision making, we can actually influence not just individuals' understanding and behavior like health education, but also the physical environment that will nudge uh, a person towards healthier behaviors. So this is something that uh, we in our team have over the year uh, developed because it's a healthy pressing framework. Right in the center of this wheel, what you will see are health behaviors, right? So we are focusing on physical activity, healthy eating, socialization, just this three to start and sleep and tobacco use, of course, are important. But surrounding this, uh, this circle, this wheel, are what we call the social environmental determinants. That means these behaviors are influenced by environmental quality, transport, green and blue spaces. You know, we have uh, health and social services, whether it's accessible, uh, community support. So it's both community as well as environment that can be influenced so that they will in turn influence healthy behaviors, which then also influences the long-term health outcomes for the individual. Now, the wheel also looks at, gives us a tool to engage let's say, different government agencies and ministries. For example, green and blue spaces. In Singapore, we work with both the National Parks Board as well as the URA, the Urban Redevelopment Authority, on the design of these right, in a particular precinct to make sure that these are, um, uh, promote, help to promote and encourage healthy behaviour. Build environment, we work closely with building and construction authority around healthy building uh, standards. And, and again, Prof Lam is, a, is an expert in this area. In community support, we work with the social service agencies within the precinct so that we can also reach out to the vulnerable and hard to reach populations uh, within the community. However, however, unfortunately, while we were in the midst of doing this, uh, COVID came, right? And COVID, I suppose, COVID-19 is the disruption of our lifetime, isn't it? Physical distancing now has uh, become a new norm, right? Instead of uh, encouraging socialization and, and exercising together. Now the new norm is, is to keep distance, you know, one to two meters apart. And now there are terms that we have to get, get um, familiar with, stay at home orders, circuit breakers, um, uh, and, and sheltering in place. I suppose these terms are so familiar now, too familiar. In the wider world, in the environment around us, we see buildings have to keep occupancy capacity below a certain number. People are expected to keep one to two meters apart from each other, and everyone is encouraged to stay at home, not use communal facilities. So all the placemaking that we've done and designed. Group activities also have been suspended uh, during this time. Even though the frameworks and approach that we have developed, I feel for healthy pressing, uh, remain relevant, but I, we, we feel that we need to change and perhaps adapt uh, to this new normal and I think this whole series about how, how to adapt to a disrupted cities is going to help us uh, to rethink and, and maybe repurpose some of the things we have planned for a different world as we emerge, hopefully, and recover out of this crisis. So first up, right, physical distancing measure has introduced new barriers to physical activity along you know, the roads that usually people commute on and also social ex exercising in groups and in public spaces. Uh, this is very real. Number of steps uh, in the US, for instance, US Fitbit data shows up to 12% drop in physical activity and number of steps in metropolitan cities. In Singapore, an unpublished study 
uh, by uh, Professor Michael Chi and team shows that there was at least a 40% decrease, 40, 40% in physical activity ever since the, the social distancing as well as uh, circuit breaker started. Um, even post COVID, we can expect that some people, many people may be fearful of congregating to use uh, fitness corners or communal spaces or use high touch exercise equipment in gyms. So some people may be motivated, for example, to exercise in groups. And because there's now no more group exercise, they may be demotivated. There were others who actually need these group exercises in order to know how to exercise, such as the elderly. And because of the of, of group exercises being canceled, now they are not doing as much exercise. This gives us many questions, some questions from the environment, right? How will it impact our thinking around fitness facilities in the community? Um, what about their maintenance? Does it need to be clean more between use? Uh, will we people use less gym and fitness facilities? Will that change the business model and the industry uh, you know, you know, irreversibly? And will public spaces, because of this, lose vitality? I think these are all very important questions uh, for urban planning as well as design. Next comes diet, right? I mean, how do people eat? What's their eating behavior? Many have moved to online grocery shopping while practicing uh, uh, um, this physical distancing. And also some, we have seen panic buying, right? Emptying shelves in supermarkets. I think the longer term impact is that, is that how will this change the way people choose uh, food? In the past, it was choice of food in restaurants or eating uh, hawker centers in Singapore. But in the future, it's around grocery buying, ingredients, ability or, 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 or knowledge of how to cook healthy meals. So these are new skills that people have to learn to, learn to uh, build up. And, and those, how about those who cannot afford delivery options? And then they have to eat near the neighborhood instead. So the availability of healthy food in everyone's neighborhood within walking distance is going to be more and more important. Again, um, the, the principle of building healthy precincts may be even more important in this context than before. I think it's going to be an impactful way of how we design also. How do we ensure sufficient density of healthy food outlets in every neighborhood, in residential areas especially? And how might we nudge people um, to, to actually uh, go for the more healthier options, uh, even in this environment where takeaway is more, going to be more frequent than dining in? There are going to be new barriers to group social interaction, face-to-face -face social support. This is a view of one of the void decks, which used to be a nice socializing space in our public housing in Singapore. Uh, underlying this is new trends around working from home, home-based learning. Uh, these are going to change the way we, we interact, where we work, shop, learn, it's going all virtual. Uh, elderly people especially may not be as savvy, tech savvy, and may not be able to communicate with their loved ones or friends. So we have to take care of that part. Not everyone can go virtual. Uh, and we do know also that the lower income families, not just in Singapore, but in other places too, may not be able to afford the laptops, the devices that's needed to go online, to go into this virtualization of the world. Um, so loss of socialization, uh, ability to access tech, the technology to do this, um, could all lead to serious consequences. We have heard of cabin fever and other mental health stresses and conditions during this time. So what will happen to public spaces which are important, right? Um, that we have been designing, spending so much time to design. Will they still be as important in the new post-COVID uh, world? I think physical distancing um, shows up uh, and highlights the gaps in our social fabric more than anything else. Um, not everybody experiences uh, work from home and home-based learning the same. Uh, there are those who are more privileged and there are those in high-density Singapore where, where there's just not enough room within their household, their apartments for three, two adults, three children to be on home-based learning and work from home at the same time. In fact, we are seeing increased family strife, even family abuse up during this time because of the stress of being enclosed in a very dense environment. I think the lower income and larger families um, tend to suffer this more and we must not forget that uh, not everybody is uh, affected equally in these times. Um, they are estimated, for example, that 9% of Singaporeans of elderly uh, live alone. And not only do they now 
unable to come out and socialize, even the senior activity centers have been closed in the last few weeks and months. This is slowly opening up, thankfully, uh, but there will still be many restrictions in terms of volunteers being able to serve them in their homes or for them to come out and, and meet their friends and relatives. So the question for built environment again is, is there a different way to design to ensure personal space and privacy despite uh, space constraints? How about residential space norms? Would they have to change? Or do we have to build up neighborhoods in terms of, in terms of social cohesion where neighbors can be empowered to take care of their direct neighbors uh, so that the community becomes stronger? And this may be more than programs. It may be really uh, encouraging movements for health even within, the, even within the society itself. So I, I must say that finally, there are opportunities as well as challenges. Um, I think in this time, we have witnessed communities band together um, to, to, to start ground up action, for instance. In the US, elsewhere, we are seeing the youth, local high school students delivering food, groceries to the elderly who stay alone. Um, there are mask making, uh, hand sanitizer making, almost cottage industry or, or volunteers coming up with solutions to help everybody cope. I think crisis sometimes brings up uh, some of these good qualities, but will they sustain? Uh, that is a good question. Will they sustain after the crisis? We do hope it will. Um, some of these are motivated by true concern and sometimes it's a fear factor, but if they can sustain beyond even, even the COVID uh, period, then I think our society can become stronger even out of this. Finally, we must think that, you know, WHO defines health as physical, mental, and social health. So I suppose even when we face something like COVID, it's not just a physical health we're worried about, but uh, even mental and social health needs to be taken care of. COVID-19 may have shrunk our life spaces. I think it has created opportunities for us to work more, eat more, exercise more within our precincts. Uh, some cities in the world, Colombia uh, in, uh, and Bogota, um, other places like Auckland, Paris, Milan, are taking this chance to, ex to, to really extend their goals of making the city more, more sustainable, for instance, uh, reclaiming roads that used to be filled with cars for, for bicycles and for pedestrians instead. Um, the longer term, in Singapore, we are seeing that more people uh, have expressed interest to continue working from home. And so then that will also determine how the future of transport and, 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 and offices and all that will be influenced in a post-COVID world. So I think in all in all, I think there will be many changes that we can expect. Uh, how do we prepare for that? Uh, COVID itself as a disease, and I'm a doctor, right? Still has many unknowns. Uh, we are still learning. Uh, we, we call it a dance, hammer and the dance. Some of you may have heard that term. So it's a dance with something that's still relatively unknown. But I think if we do it wisely and make the correct uh, adjustments and hopefully in, with eye to the long term, we can actually emerge from this hopefully healthier and safer for everyone. So uh, thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Lok, for that very thought-provoking presentation. We've received some questions uh, about the availability of the presentations um, after the webinar ends. This webinar is recorded and we will upload it on our CLC YouTube channel, so do look out for that. Our next speaker is a different type of doctor since he has a PhD in architecture from Carnegie Mellon University. Professor Lam Ki Po is Provost Chair, Professor of Architecture and Building, and the Dean of my alma mater, the School of Design and Environment at the National University of Singapore. Professor Lam is an architect and researcher who specializes in computational design support systems for total building performance analysis and building diagnostics. He sits on multiple boards, including our very own CLC Advisory Board, as well as Delos USA, which established the world's first building standard focused exclusively on human health and wellness. Professor Lam is also a member of the International Well Building Institute's Task Force on COVID-19 and other respiratory infections. This task force is a multidisciplinary team of more than 225 experts to help define 
the critical role buildings, organizations, and communities play in reducing the health burden from this and other infectious diseases. Without further ado, let me hand the time over to Professor Lam. Professor, the mic is yours. Okay. Can everyone see my screen? Can anyone see my screen? Okay. I'm sharing. Thank you very much, Dinesh, for the introduction. And uh, I want to thank uh, CLC for inviting me to share at this inaugural webinar this afternoon. Dr. Luke's message is very clear to me. At the heart of it, healthy cities are ultimately about healthy people. There's no two way about it. If the city is healthy, the people will be healthy. So that's the litmus test. And as Dr. Luke also said, the World Health Organization had indeed uh, defined health as a state of complete physical, mental, and social well being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. And of course, this applies to both young and old alike. Well, for each of us, depending on how we earn our living or who pays our salaries, the work that we do tend to focus on those things that our bosses tell us that matter in our jobs and the business. For example, real estate developers will perhaps see the city as physical investment opportunities. Economists may see cities as engine of economic growth. And people migrate from rural to urban centers at unprecedented rates to hopefully get a piece of that pie. The fact is this, cities are extremely complex ecosystems. Everything is connected in one way or another. Many such connections are well known and scientifically documented, while others are still being discovered. I think the current COVID-19 pandemic is a stark example of that. So how can we grapple with this complexity as a human species inhabiting this planet? Well, in 2015, the United Nations member states adopted the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. It provides a blueprint for shared peace and prosperity for people and planet now and in the future. At the core of this are 17 Sustainable Development Goals or SDGs as they are commonly referred to. And these are urgent call for actions for both developed and developing countries in a global partnership. Well, I've been following the progress reports produced by the UN Economic and Social Commission for Asia and Pacific, ASCAP. Here is, you can see on screen, the latest 2020 report. On the whole, we are not doing so well in meeting the interim targets. If we, we are supposed to meet the 2019 target and you can see things are falling behind. As an educator, I'm always encouraged though that the quality education, which is the number four item, um, still leads the pack, followed closely by affordable and clean energy, which I'm also intimately involved in. However, in 2017, when if you look at that report, education actually crossed the target line, but now it has fallen behind. This indicates to me that we cannot just stand still and stick with business as usual. However good we think the business as usual already is at any moment in time. Circumstances are changing at an ever increasing pace. We have no choice but to leapfrog whenever we can in order to meet those goals in the long run. The worrying part to me, it's goal number 12. You can see the, red, the long red bar heading the opposite direction, which is responsible consumption and production. 
We were not doing well even in 2017. But with the increasing physical and economic growth of countries and cities, we are confronted with this critical issue now that is inextricably linked to two major global challenges, climate change and health. Dr. Locke has provided some stats earlier. And when irresponsible consumption encroaches uncontrollably on nature and wildlife, we suffer the consequences. Cities exist in what I call a space-time continuum. Our real estate economic system is predicated on dollars per square meter or per square foot, depending on where you are. Hence, the focus is on two-dimensional gross floor area rather than three-dimensional volumetric space. In fact, we treat volume as a bad thing because it is wasteful due to the need for thermal conditioning energy use. However, the fact remains, health is related to the volume that each one of us inhabit, both at the outdoor and the indoor. Many cities uh, traditionally plan to segregate commercial from residential, from recreational and industry. While it may appear efficient as in, from one perspective, it is not necessary an optimal use of resources within that space-time continuum. COVID-19 has brought a painful reminder to all of us. Social distancing, decongestion of gathering spaces, indoor, outdoor transportation are all necessary drastic steps to curb the spread as uh, Dr. Luke has uh, explained to us. As we look at the Singapore context, it turns out that it has indeed laid a strong foundation in its conceptualization and implementation of town planning since the beginning of nation building. You can look at the diagram in the slide on the bottom left. The notion of hierarchical structure of a town from neighborhood to the precinct to the town center works extremely well to address many of those pandemic related issues we are confronting today. We can still walk relatively short distances to get access to essential goods in an organized, time scheduled, and spatially distributed manner. The 3D physical manifestation of our built environment to deal with high density can be very different as can, as can be seen here at the two contrasting uh, pictures at the top of the slide. It all depends on our collective value proposition as a community and as a nation that extends beyond dollar per square foot. And as the city of Seoul, the recipient of the 2018 Lee Kuan Yew World City Prize demonstrated to us, it is not achieved by a top-down bureaucratic approach, but by an innovative and socially inclusive partnership of the people. The same principle can be applied not only to developed nations, but also developing nations. However, there has to be some balance, I maintain, between an extreme laser fair approach versus some incentivized order, I call it. And a good example is here at uh, Kampong Pelangi, the bottom picture in Samarang, where the government provided a small sum of a US $22,000 to the residents and they literally went out and painted the town. It nurtured the sense of community, belonging, pride, and also displayed the artistic talents of some of those residents uh, who are, as you know, Javanese are well known for. Many studies have shown that uh, the design of our built environment can affect our behavior either in a positive or negative way. From the medical point of view, this particular study that I've shown here revealed that social, behavioral, and environment contribute some 60% on the impact of premature death and disabilities. Healthcare contributes only 10%, while 30% is attributed to genetics. In other words, you, you're born with it. 
But even then, the fact is that conducive environments can further mitigate the impact due to genetics. The question I always ask when I see this diagram, how much are we as a society willing to commit to R&D in these various sectors? I know for a fact that the built environment is getting a relatively minuscule portion compared to healthcare R&D and pharmaceutical uh, research. Let me also hasten to add, uh, unless you think that I'm out for grabbing, you know, bigger piece of the pie, it is not about splitting that resource pie. It is about encouraging true cross-disciplinary effort where all team members get commensurate resources to do an effective and holistic job. And in that count, I would love to have Dr. Luke as a client for all my projects because he is just going to help push the success of those kind of projects. In SDE at NUS, we are advocating such a holistic approach with a tagline, Well and Green. The green building movement that started back in the early 1990s has reached a certain maturity now around the world, driven by standards such as LEED, Brian, CASPI, and our own Singapore Green Mark, et cetera. However, wellness is, in, uh, is relatively new in its development. In 2014, after some six years of intensive R&D with the Mayo Clinic in the US, the International Well Building Institute, or IWBI, launched the world's first well building standard. An update version two was launched in 2018, and this is what is illustrated here in this slide. It comprises 10 features that, comp uh, that includes air, water, nourishment, light, movement, thermal comfort, sound, materials, mind, and community. Some of these features have already been incorporated in green building standards, like air and light and thermal comfort. So the, those are not new. This standard is formulated based on scientific evidence, transparently developed, and is meant to be broadly relevant to different building types and communities. And last year, a pilot uh, scheme uh, called Well Community Standard was also introduced, expanding the scope beyond just individual buildings to neighborhoods and precincts with the collection of buildings and as well as the outdoor environment. I see an amazing potential alignment for this uh, with the town planning concept in Singapore, which I've mentioned just now. In Singapore, that's also an encouraging development. And if I may say ahead of COVID-19, in 2018, BCA and the Health Promotion Board jointly launched the Green Mark for Healthier Workplaces. And I know more development work is uh, on its way. SDE is pleased and proud to, as they will, walk the talk as we seek to educate the next generation of professionals to tackle all these challenges of creating a sustainable, healthy, and resilient nation. SDE4, as you can see here, has practically demonstrated the feasibility of net zero energy building in our hot, humid, tropical condition while maintaining comfort and wellness. Uh, you should notice the pleasant staircases for exercise and uh, preservation of the natural environment. This is made possible because of what PM Lee referred to as good design thinking. He said that good design thinking was a key reason for Singapore's success journey from third world to first, and it will be critical in the country's future transformation for it to remain an outstanding city in the world, end quote. Motivated by these principles of participatory planning and design approaches, Several IT-enabled design support tools are available and can be deployed for such initiatives. What is seen here, for example, is a platform called CD Scope developed by the MIT Media Lab, which is an open source platform for such use. Both AI and AR can also be further incorporated to support the decision making uh, in, the, in the collective uh, process. We can obviously do this in a virtual setting as well if social distancing remains necessary from time to time. 
We here in Singapore has also an initiative called the Virtual Singapore Initiative, and that can be further developed for our own local use. So to recap, we have to seriously recognize that cities are complex ecosystems. We have to deal with it holistically, as Dr. Luke has also pointed out. Otherwise, the weakest link can destroy the whole if the other subsystems, even though the other subsystems are robust and resilient. Remember to treat nature with respect and nature will in turn provide for us and treat us well. Remember, prevention is always better and cheaper than cure. So let's work hard to prevent further you know, uh, problems from occurring. Thank you very much and uh, stay well. Thank you, Professor Lam, for that great presentation. Let me now invite Dr. Lok to join us for the moderated dialogue. For a start, let's review the results of our poll. 653 of you took part, and uh, it's interesting to see that 70% noticed uh, less air pollution in the environment around you, be it air or noise pollution. And only 7% said that they haven't experienced any improvements uh, to, their, to their lifestyles and the environment. So let me start. Uh, that's a good segue to the question that I would like to pose to Dr. Loke. Um, you noted several obstacles, Dr. Loke, uh, that COVID-19 poses to healthy lifestyles from diet to exercise. At the same time, uh, anecdotally, and, and I include myself in this group, there are some of us who, who notice we are eating or sleeping better, exercising more. Uh, could it be that the effects of COVID-19 are felt differently across different demographics uh, and that for some groups that might have already been struggling with um, living a healthy lifestyle, perhaps uh, uh, older populations or lower income groups, these challenges could be exacerbated while for different groups, uh, they might actually see an improvement. Yeah, I think, I think that's a good question. And it's also a good poll that you conducted across the audience. I think we may be quite a self-selected group, you know, even the participants in this, uh, in this webinar. I think COVID-19 and, and the restrictions that come with it, right? It's actually the restrictions may actually bite harder than even the disease itself sometimes because it affects everybody, affects different people differently. And I think if we've got one of the important points is about income levels, right? I think not everybody has the privilege of having a choice to even work from home. Uh, in, in fact, imagine a, a low-wage worker anywhere, Singapore, elsewhere, that is can can only do work that is essential, so to speak, it has to be front-facing, whether cleaning or or, or front-end shop uh, counter staff. There's no choice. They have to be out there, exposed to to contagion. They come back to a home, a family that is crowded because of well, the cost of living is high, right? Uh, in cities, many cities in the world, it's actually those vulnerable parts of the population who stay in overcrowded housing that tends to get hit the worst. So not only is there a, a risk of getting infected, there's a risk of infecting back home. Then imagine they have to do one job, two jobs, different um, delivery where they are in contact with people, different people at different times of the day, the, the risk just go up. And so the, the stresses of that, right, the fears, the stresses add on. And, and indeed, we are seeing actually the stress is faced by, by exactly this more vulnerable groups. Of course, as a society, uh, we, we must never leave them behind. And, and it, is, it, it shows up, especially in these times, right? I mean, yeah. not all of us are, are able to, 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 be, to enjoy what, what the, the environment can, can bring to us at this time. It is true, the air is cleaner. I'm privileged. But I also know that there are many who, who actually in this time are facing even more stresses than usual. Yeah. Absolutely. I, I think I've seen this expression, we're all in the same storm, but we're not in the same boat. Um, thank you, Dr. Lok. Professor Lam, I have a question for you now. COVID-19 seems to have re-energized some pre-existing debates amongst urbanists on the merits of urban density. Uh, I think in the United States, some people feel that dense cities like New York have suffered the most. 
Um, and has, this has only reinforced all anxieties about living a safe and healthy life in high density environments. Mm. But others have pointed out that many high density East Asian cities have done pretty well so far during this pandemic. What are your own thoughts on what COVID-19 might be teaching us about the relationship between urban density and healthy cities? Yeah, um, as I said, I think when we talk about density, let's remember the very definition of density is volumetric, okay? So we need to look at the, almost the kind of the, the, the three layers, the ground, the sky, and some might even if they include underground. Now, of course, we're not saying people should live underground. I'm not advocating that. But as a city, there are those potential uh, for different differentiating the different needs and requirements that each of those environmental contexts, sky, ground, and underground, can in fact cater for. I think that's one strategy that we need to really look at very carefully. Okay, you know density, and and I know this argument about mega cities uh, that constantly uh, been surfacing. Right, the definition is more than ten million people. My personal take is that if you look at all the economic and quality of life and happiness statistics, those mega cities don't do that well relative to other you know, smaller cities. So the idea that size will bring you know, growth and, and, and prosperity is actually not true. Uh, I was watching the Men in Black uh, one of those reruns, and the alien was saying, you know, when will you humans ever learn that size doesn't matter? <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it really is important for us to look at the space-time combination, right, so that we are able to deploy the resources in a dynamic way. <clears throat> you know, we, we build downtown, uh, and cities, those downtowns become dead zones in the night, right, in the evening, in the old days, and many cities are still like that. What a waste, right? Yep. But if we can energize those and begin to then distribute the population into various options, right, so that not everybody needs to go to the same place at any one time, I think that would relieve the pressure. And, and as I said earlier, that the idea of the town, new town planning, that, that fundamental concept can be applied and scaled up uh, in different uh, contexts in, in city uh, building. I wish must, again, I want to personally emphasize this, we've got to try and avoid this constant push towards bigger and bigger and bigger things. Okay, great. Thank you, uh, Professor. All right, uh, we're running a little over time, but let's try to take one question from our audience. And this comes from uh, one of our WCS young leaders, Chin Tan, who says, um, uh, this is the opportunity we have in the next six to eight months to change people's behaviors towards active mobility before the vaccines are out. We need more bikes, PMDs, and walking in this healthy city. Any thoughts? Uh, I think this echoes uh, several other questions that we received from the audience. And a discussion that has popped up around the world as well. Is this the moment to be pushing a lot more for cycling, walking? Uh, what are your thoughts, gentlemen? Maybe I, I jump in first. I, I think in terms of thinking how to change behaviours to become more healthy and in a sustainable way, I, I, I must say COVID-19, if, if there's a good point coming out of this, is when when there are fewer cars and people are walking more. Uh, habits are changing and people are starting to enjoy even uh, seeing the blue skies and the, and the green grass and, and wildflowers, right? Things that you don't, never see very much of uh, in the normal day, uh, in the normal working day. And I think these are good times when behaviors start to change. Uh, some cities have taken the advantage of this really to advance sustainability goals such as active mobility, I say reclaiming roads back for pedestrians as well as cycling tracks. Uh, and, and they are making full use of this time, right? Where the cars are not, because offices are closed and all that. To, to start getting people to use it and to enjoy these uh, uh, active mobility options. I think with, if working from home becomes a norm, then we're also going to see 
greater move away from central CBD kind of style and maybe movement of some of the work into suburbs and, and outside of the cities. And so then the locality and there are questions around hyper-locality uh, where we can build facility, work, live and play within a neighborhood. And then it also becomes more sustainable to have options such as walking and cycling to become the norm. I think all these are very positive. And um, again, if, don't let a crisis go to waste, right? That's a saying. Uh, why not we use this time to just build these habits? And I think city planners, mayors, you know, people in, in, in with that authority and the decision making could, could actually start using this time to push for these. Well said. Don't waste a good crisis. And I actually think we have several mayors in our audience here today amongst us. Professor Lam, anything yes. to add? Well, just a quick point. In our design and planning, we have to remember it is not all about you know, the direct effectiveness or efficiency of things. In other words, if you want to get from point A to point B, it's not about getting from point A to point B. It's about that journey, that experience, right? Take it easy. Look around, trees, birds, whatever, right? That experience in that journey is equally important. And sometimes we tend to take the most effective efficient way of solving a problem without understanding this nuance of creating that, that journey. And I think by doing that, and as Dr. Lok said, creating the appropriate infrastructure, and it will also help to you know, uh, redistribute, if you like, uh, the kind of uh, uh, congestion and so on. And that is going to be really important. And then secondly, reduce the environmental you know, discomfort, of course. Um, mitigate urban heat island, do planting, use, you know, water features for evaporative cooling. We have a very good bag of tricks, if you like, to solve all this. It's not the issue. The issue is having that holistic uh, vision. Then we can uh, bring all these things to bear. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, uh, I think if anything is clear, COVID-19 has taught us, has is teaching us a lot of lessons and, uh, uh, we've heard uh, insights on some of those lessons here today. We've come to the end of our webinar. Dr. Lok and Professor Lam, thank you again for generously sharing your time and your insights with us. We are also excited to share that our next webinar on the 4th of June is on a city of green and blue. Our speaker is Professor Peter Rowe, Distinguished Service Professor of Harvard University's Graduate School of Design. The webinar will be based on his book, A City in Green and Blue. My colleague, Dr. Lee Min He, co-author of the book and director at CLC, will also be a panelist. Please register using the QR code or the link. We hope you'll join us then. Finally, a warm thank you to you, our audiences, who have joined us from around the world. Uh, before you leave, please fill in our feedback form to tell us how we're doing and, how we, and what we can do to improve. Please use the QR code or the link to access the form. A reminder to members of the Singapore Institute of Planners or the Singapore Institute of Landscape Architects, please fill in your registration number in the feedback form. Until our next webinar on the 4th of June, goodbye for now from Singapore. Stay healthy, everyone.